Thank you, Brother Chris. Oh, that's good. I like it. I like it. Brother Adams, remember that Sunday night on a Christmas cantata, or Sunday morning on a Christmas cantata? So you were able to lead Brother Chris to Christ. And remember that service? Oh, that was sweet. Now see him up singing. That's good stuff. I like it. I like it. I like the song too. Amen. Hallelujah. Take your Bibles, please. Turn to the book of Mark, chapter 3. A real practical message. I encourage you strongly. Take notes. Kind of like when Jesus constrained the disciples to get into a boat. That means if they hadn't gotten a boat, he'd have put them in the boat. So I encourage you strongly. Take notes. Um, I had several people have asked me, say, Pastor, you talk about this, this idea of discipleship and, and taking somebody who got saved and what to do next. And well, that's what these Sunday night messages are about. We're going to teach you some very practical things. Uh, just nuts and bolts kind of things. We'll be looking uh, at some Bible examples of how to help somebody from the point they get saved to where they get to where they're the one out soul winning and leading other people to Christ. Amen? And by the way, that is part of the Great Commission. Uh, I had you there in Mark. Uh, just go back a couple pages. Keep Mark 3 there. Go back to, um, to Matthew 28. Uh, just a couple pages in your Bible. Matthew 28. We read these verses this morning. By the time the year's over, we'll all have these memorized. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. I have commanded you. Excuse me. And lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. Amen. That's the Great Commission. We're commanded not just to get the gospel to people and see them saved, not just to get them baptized, but our job is not finished till they're doing everything God commanded us to do. Yes, sir. It means we got work to do. Yeah. Can I tell you something? We'll be working on that till we hear the trumpet sound. Yeah. Amen. Uh, Mark chapter 3 in your Bible, please. Uh, we looked at these verses uh, last Sunday a little bit. Uh, but we're going to kind of use these as our foundation this morning or this evening. It might be morning before we're done. I don't think so. I don't think we'll be real long. But I've thought that before. <laughs> Mark chapter 3, look at verse 13. And he goeth up into a mountain and called unto him whom he would. And they came unto him, and he ordained twelve that they should be with him, that he might send them forth to preach. We'll stop right there. Let's go ahead and pray. We'll get into the message. Father, we need your help tonight as we look into the subject of how to be a discipler, how to take the things that you've taught us and transfer that to somebody else. And as part of the task you gave us, you told us not just to win the lost, not just to see them baptized. But we're to work with them to where they get plugged into church, where they're in Sunday school and they're in church and they're in Sunday night church and Wednesday night church and, and they're involved in the outreach ministries and, and they get plugged into a ministry of the church. Because that's what you instructed us to do. So I pray you to help us as we study tonight. May we learn some things uh, that would help us understand the bigger picture. And then help us to be motivated to obedience. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, for many of us, we've already made commitments to our theme. Families reaching families. Uh, by the way, I hope you're using uh, your, uh, your little booklets, your, your discipleship booklet, or your... your uh, um, prospect booklet that's the term we're using and uh, we put this together for you and if you don't have one they're on the back table back there place for you to list the people that you're working on I've got names in mind and I've got a couple I need to transfer into here that I've talked to in the last couple days that I haven't got in my book yet uh, but I've got some and this one here I, you know, I made a call to him today and uh, just some others that we're working on uh, and, and just like we were talking earlier it's good to track those things keep record of it it's amazing how quickly stuff gets away from you like, well, I haven't seen them in a week or two. Then you start checking, they haven't been here in four weeks or five. And by the way, I want you to be thinking about who you didn't see today. I've got a list that, I, that I'll be talking to and, and uh, that, that aren't here for one reason or another. And, uh, but here we see, uh, we, we've made the commitments and we're, we're saying, okay, we want God to use us to reach somebody else. Let's put you on the spot. How many of you really want God to use you this year to reach somebody else for Him? My hand's up. I was thrilled Thursday. I got to give the plan of salvation. There one person individually and others got to hear it. 
Man, I love doing that. I do. I just, you get in the middle of it. And, and Brother Mark, I almost start laughing sometimes. Like, man, I get to tell somebody about Jesus. And that's, I, I, was, I was really kind of overwhelmed with it Thursday as I'm sitting there in a government facility. A bunch of military guys walking around. And I mean, you know, here's guys in uniform everywhere. And here's young guys about to be a Marine. And, uh, and, and he's asking questions. And I get to answer him from the Bible. Amen. Praise God. And uh, that's worth getting out of bed in the morning for, amen. And, uh, and so uh, on Sunday mornings, we've been looking at now, we started the series this morning of how, uh, who Jesus reached and how he reached them. We're looking at his soul winning, and, and, but we don't want to just stop with getting the gospel to somebody. And I think you ought to carry your tracks. Yeah. And uh, this is not part of the outline, but during the, the, the next year, you're going to hear me saying a lot about your TNT tracks, the New Testament. Hope you have some with you. I won't ask you tonight. I won't do the test. But it's coming, so just plan on it. Amen. Uh, but uh, how many of you really want to see people saved? Amen. Really want it? Yeah. Okay, do you want it enough to carry a track in New Testament? Yeah. Do you want it enough to give people tracks? Yeah. We only really believe what moves us to action. And as, as we get thinking about this, about, okay, this is, this is what we want to do, and as a church, this is what we need to do. We know we're commanded to do it, and I don't know about you, I want to be obedient. I want to please the Lord, and uh, you know the great thing about soul winning, when you go out and you're witnessing to people, and you're giving out the gospel, you're working with them, trying to get them to, to come to know the Lord, even if they don't respond, you've been obedient. It's not our job to win them. That's the Holy Spirit's job. It's, we're just messengers. That's why uh, in Acts 1 and verse number 8, Jesus said to the disciples, He said, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and, 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 and all Judea and Samaria and the innermost part of the earth. No, notice in, in that case, as well as in, in Matthew, in both cases, He talks about the power it's from Him, and the power was for witnessing. Matthew 28. You know, he says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore, because I have all power, I'm sending you. In Acts 1.8, he tells us, I'm sending you with the power. Hallelujah for that. But as we think about that, how are we going to get folks to, to where they get plugged into church, where they are, they're wanting to come on Sunday night, and they carry their Bible, and they're witnessing to the people at work, and they're carrying tracts. We're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. Notice about the disciples here. As uh, uh, Jesus here, he, he goes up into a mountain. He had just uh, healed a bunch of folks there in the earlier part of the chapter. And now in, in verse number 13, he goes up into a mountain and says, He called unto him whom he would. So out of that big group, he said, A bunch of folks, come with me. You imagine Jesus doing that to you? Just come with me. Like, okay. Uh, I think I kind of understand how that would feel. One on one. Uh, when I was, uh, if you just allow me to use personal illustrations, because it's all ones I have. Um, Thursday, when I was at the uh, the map station, and I was speaking to uh, Major Shields, he's the the commander of the station there. Uh, we're at his office, and he needed to take care of something. He said, "Chaplain, come with me." Well, a major tells you to come with you. Just come. Amen, Brother John? When they, you know? And, so, and I'm a guest in his facility. I'm there because he lets me come. Yes, sir, whatever you want. And so I'm walking with him and we're talking. That's, that's what Jesus did to these folks. He said, he called on him whom he would. And then notice what else it says there in Mark chapter 3. And uh, this is a verse we, we've touched on several times recently, but it's something I think we ought to just uh, look at and get a hold of. Verse 14, and he ordained 12. So these are the 12 disciples, and he lists them in verses uh, 16 and following. He lists those that he chose to, uh, to be his disciples. He said, he ordained 12 that they should be, what's the word? With him, that he might send them forth to preach. To give you some practical tips for being a disciple, how to help somebody get beyond being just a babe in Christ. They just got saved. What happens next? Number one, be accessible. Be accessible. Notice Jesus said uh, here that he ordained 12 that they should be with him. You see, they had to be with him if they were going to go for him. You see what he says there in that verse? Look at verse 14 again. He ordained 12 that they should be with him that he might send them forth to preach. If you're not hanging around with Jesus, you won't go for him. 
Nobody goes to the mission field who hadn't been reading their Bible, praying, right. and walking with God, faithful in church. No, you don't, you don't surrender to God to go to the mission field if you've not been with Him. Uh, keep your place here, but go to the book of Acts chapter 13. You've got to see this one. It's a good illustration of it. And my favorite illustrations are Bible illustrations. Because God thought enough to write them down. Um, I have a few books in my library that just mean a lot to me because my dad bought them for me. And one of them is 10,000 illustrations from the Bible. And it just lists the stories of the Bible by topic. It is a cool book. And, uh, but in Acts 13, uh, before we start reading, uh, we know the story of what was going on here. This was the church at Antioch in Acts 11. Barnabas had come and, and seen them. And he, he, as we talked about last week, that, uh, that, that he, he, he encouraged them, exhorted them that with purpose of heart they should cleave unto the Lord. And much people was added to the Lord, it says. And then uh, he went to, uh, uh, it says that he, he went to Tarsus for to seek Saul. He brought him back to, to Antioch and they stayed there a year. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. And, and then uh, during, in chapter number 12, uh, there, was a, uh, there was a problem. I'm sorry, in the end of chapter 11, there was a problem in Jerusalem uh, and, and different things going on there. And, and, uh, and in chapter 12, the uh, uh, Peter's arrested, and, and you have that story. In Acts chapter 13, the, the, you have Paul and Barnabas, or as they were still called Barnabas and Saul at that point. They had gone to take the gifts from the believers at Antioch back to the church at Jerusalem to help them financially because uh, there was a dearth, and they didn't have much food, and, and so they helped them. That's what believers do. They help each other. Right. Amen? And, uh, and then they get back here. Look at verse number 1 of chapter 13. It says, now, there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene and Mayan, and, uh, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted. Notice, these weren't just casual attendees at church. They were ministering to the Lord. They were serving God. They were busy. Amen? And, and they were ministering. They were fasting. Uh, so these were serious people of prayer. And uh, it says, And uh, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. When they fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. Here we have Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. Uh, why did God call them? Well, part of the reason was they were ministering to the Lord. They were serving God in that church. Amen? You know, when God wants to get a job done, He looks at people who are already busy. He don't like lazy people. The, the, the word in Proverbs is slothful. The sluggard. Uh, these men were busy serving God and what did God do? God called them. They were ministering to the Lord. Why did they go on a first missionary journey? Because they were already with Him. They were ministering to Him. Notice it didn't say they were ministering for Him. Look at it again, verse number 2. As they ministered to the Lord. Hello. Why do you do what you do? Is it for Him or is it to Him? When you're playing a piano special. Is it to Him? It ought to be. It ought to be worship. These were men that were concerned about him. They were fasting. And these are serious men that were, that were at the church. And we see in verse number 13 that they were called prophets and teachers. They were people busy working in the church, but they did it to the Lord. And God said, I like it. I'm going I'm to I'm send them on the work. Uh, you see, they had been with the Lord. Uh, we see this in, in the life of Christ as we see back in our text in Mark where he says he called to them whom he would and then from them he chose 12 that they should be with him that he should send them forth to preach. If you're going to be used of God to influence someone to grow in, their, in grace and to grow in their walk with God, you'll have to be accessible. You see what I mean by that? It means you're going to have to give them more time than just sitting in the pew next to them during a church service. We saw this in our example. Go to John chapter 1. We looked at this the last two Sunday mornings. And, and, and I'm not going to preach these because I've preached already a couple messages on it. We have a couple more to come. Uh, but verse number 38. When the, the two disciples that had heard John and 
uh, they, they followed Jesus, verse 37, verse 38 says, Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and said unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, be, uh, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? And he saith unto them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt. I want you to underline the next part of the verse, number 39. And abode with him that day. You see, when Jesus was going to work with Andrew now, he wasn't just going to speak to him in a public setting. They said, well, where do you live? We'll, we'll come see. He invited them to the house. He inv- you know what that means? He let them be with him. So why don't you just come spend the day with me? And we wonder why Jesus was able to so influence those men because he was with them and he invited them to be with him. He was accessible. He was going to invest his life in them and that was not going to be just from a pulpit. Now, I love preaching. It's my favorite thing to do. I'd rather preach than eat and I like eating. I love to preach. Why? Because that's what God called me to do. But the call to ministry is way more than call to preach. That's the bonus stuff. It takes young preachers a long time to figure that out. In fact, I think we use the wrong term. Not that God calls us to preach. He calls us to the ministry. Notice what he said in Acts 13. Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. Preaching's the fun part. It is. Uh, that's, the, I mean, that's, the, that's the part that, man, you get to get up and brag on Jesus. How fun is that? Amen? Where's the work? When you're with folks trying to help them, that's work. Most of the ministry of Jesus was not preaching. It was being with people. He was going to funerals and breaking it up, raising people from the dead. I mean, I'll do that one. I'd like to have been there for one of those. Hallelujah. Would not have been a good business to be an undertaker in Jesus' ministry. <laughs> you wouldn't have had much to do, amen. Jesus would find people that need to be healed. He would, he would heal them. And, and it isn't it interesting, everyone that he saved and everyone that he healed, you see over and over again, they want to hang around with him. If you're going to influence somebody, you've got to let them in close. You know why a lot of believers don't do that? Because you're going to get hurt. Jesus said, come on, I want you to be with me. Yeah, and one of those betrayed him. Brought soldiers to arrest him. See, that's going to happen. When you invest in the lives of people, some of those that you bring in the closest are going to be ones that stab you in the back. So I don't like it. It's life. Jesus had 12, and one of those did that to him. But it's worth that to have the other 11. Amen? I mean, I'll take that to get a John, to get a Peter. I mean, think of it. And so you got to get, you got to let them come in close. Uh, it says that they came and they saw where he dwelt. We see it in, in this story. We see it, uh, good, good if you would, to uh, 2 Peter. I'm just going to look at some Bible examples because I want you to understand these are not just some concepts I dreamed up one day. I didn't hear them in a seminar somewhere. These are things I found in the pages of the Bible. 2 Tim, uh, sorry, 2 Peter. Guess it would help if I got to 2 Peter. I'm at 1 Peter, and that one didn't look right. That one looks right. All right. Uh, 2 Peter, chapter 1. Look at verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we've made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. Now he's describing this event, uh, what we would call the the Mount of Transfiguration, where, where Jesus had invited Peter, James, and John. From the twelve he chose three to come a little farther And he took them with him on top of the mountain. And while he was there, uh, Jesus was displayed in all of his glory. As Brother Johnny Pope used to word it, he said the the Shekinah glory of God broke through the prison bars of his flesh. They got to see him as he really is. Peter later said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Well, I guess. I read that like that's one of those duh statements, you know. You think about an understatement. But it says we were 
with him. You see, God was going to do something very special with Peter, James, and John. Now, we know who Peter is. We know who John is. But James pastored the first church in, in, in Jerusalem. He was, he was the one that was the leader uh, of that body of believers when Jesus uh, left. <coughs> These were men that God had a special plan for. So what did Jesus do? He drew them in close. The point is, he invited them into a special setting. If you're really going to influence somebody, you're going to have to invite them in. You're going to have to inconvenience yourself and your schedule so you can bring them in close. That's what Jesus said. Go to Matthew 26, please. Matthew chapter 26. And look at verse number 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith to the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. See, I told you he was a southerner. Some of you didn't catch that. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death, tarry ye here and watch with me. Do you understand what Jesus is doing? He's taken the disciples, the 11, because Judas has already left, and he's gone to get the soldiers to betray him. Jesus takes them into that garden of Gethsemane where the Bible says he had resorted often. That's why Judas knew where to find him. He takes the disciples, and then from the three, he says, guys, come with me. You realize what's about to happen? He's now about to agonize over taking our sin. When he says to the Father a little bit later in the chapter, Father, it would be possible, let this cup pass from me. He wasn't talking about the crucifixion. He was talking about taking our sin. There was no other way for our sin to be covered than for Jesus to take it. Now picture him as he's, he's getting ready to separate now and he's going to pray and now he's going to communicate with the Father about what's next. What's next? The crucifixion. He's about to take upon him all of our guilt and he says to three guys, would you watch with me? Would you pray with me? Can you imagine? Years ago uh, when I was in college, I got to preach at the Pacific Guard Mission in, in Chicago. Uh, that's the place where D.L. Moody got saved. He actually got saved in a street meeting run by the people from Pacific Guard Mission. Rescue Mission right in, in the middle of, of Chicago. I'm sure y'all got to go there, didn't you? And uh, you ever pray with Harry Solonier? I get invited into the prayer room. Dr. Solonier was the, was the director of the mission. You talk about someone who knew how to pray. When he prayed, you knew God showed up. It kind of got thick in the room like it did with the, in, in, in uh, Solomon's day. When they were praying in the temple and the glory of the Lord filled the temple, the priest had to leave because there wasn't room. It'd be like that when he'd pray. You'd hear him praying over those men, those drunks and drug addicts. He'd start weeping and praying. I remember one day they put me right next to him as he's praying. Still mad at whoever did that to me. I hear that man praying and I realize, you know, I, you know, I, was, I was 17 years old. And I realized, I don't know God the way he does. And hearing him pour his heart out. Now he gets done, he said, okay, but Doug, you pray. I said, I don't feel like it. You wouldn't have either. I, you know, lay me down to sleep. You know, but, you know one of those. <laughs> and, and, man, to hear those men cry out like that. I remember when I first traveled with Dr. Boyd, and he'd take each of us on different nights back into the area where he would pray. You'd hear Brother Boyd begin to pray. And you know what? It made an impact on me. Why? Because he let me in that sacred place. Picture Jesus now on the night he's about to be betrayed says to these three men, I want you to come a little closer. What's he trying to do? He's trying to teach them some things you don't get unless you get close. He allowed them to, to be in his presence in those dark hours. He was accessible while he was praying. If you're going to influence somebody, you're going to have to let them get close even when you're facing difficult times. When you're facing the biggest challenge of your life, 
you're facing a big trial, things are just, the wheels are coming off the bus. That's not the time to stay home. That's the time to get close to God's people. You don't run out, you run in. You see, people need to see you going through the difficulty and they need to see you trusting God. They need to see how you handle it. How's a new convert going to learn that? That's the problem with this teaching in a lot of Bible colleges where they teach the preachers to be Superman. You don't ever let anybody see you down. You don't ever let anybody see you weak. You're always on top side. You never let them see you where you're struggling. Well, that's, that's dishonest, number one. Even Jesus groaned in John 11 when he looks out and he sees Mary and Martha's family weeping over Lazarus. The Bible says Jesus wept. And the people around him said, oh, how he loved him. What made Jesus real to those people in the room, those Jews that hated him? They saw that he was real. That here was his friend. His friend had died and now he's mourning. He's grieving. Now, Jesus wasn't grieving for Lazarus because he knew he, what he was fixing to do. Amen. Lazarus about to get up. They didn't know that. Who was he grieving for? He was grieving for the family. They were hurting. And by the way, that's not part of the message, but isn't it a wonderful thing to know that when you hurt, he does? He tells us he can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. It's interesting, never says that the father weeps. Not one verse in your Bible will you find the father weeping, but you will find where it says Jesus wept. We sometimes joke about, that's the shortest verse in the Bible. Oh, but what truth is there? You start weeping, he knows how to tell the father what you're going through. Hallelujah. He gets his prayers answered, by the way. If you're going to influence somebody, if you're going to help them grow in grace, you're going to have to let them get close. Uh, Jesus did that in, uh, in Matthew uh, when he was in the boat with the disciples. Remember that when he was there with them and he was asleep and the storm came up? And the winds are crashing and they go down and wake him and said, you know, Master, cares thou not that we perish? And I like what the song says, if Jesus said we're going to go over, you're not going under. He said we're going to go over to the other side. Why were they worried? Man, they're all, they're all nervous. I mean, you know, they're just like, what's going to happen? So Jesus goes to the deck of the ship, you know, and says to the winds, peace. Says to the waves, be still. They said, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey his voice? We look at that story. I think sometimes, Brother Rich, we don't get the magnitude of that. Jesus showed them how to react in a storm. When God's with you, you don't have to worry about the storm. He was going through that. He had them close. If we're going to make a difference in the lives of people, they need to see that our Christianity is not something we put on like a suit on Sunday morning. It's real. It's something that, that every day is part of us. Jesus allowed these people to get close to them. He said, I want you to be with me so I can send you forth. You will not influence people greatly for God by keeping them at arm's length. When I, was, when I first got to San Diego, um, when I got to Lighthouse, I was not planning on getting involved in anything. I told my wife, we're not doing nothing. I'm just going to sit here. Yeah, that wasn't going to work. But uh, <laughs> I'm sitting there, and, and, and I was, Brother Wade one day asked me to teach in his Sunday school class. And I said, okay, I'll do that. And, and uh, Brother Wade's about half crazy. Now, he's all, he's all, the, all the way crazy. And uh, former um, Navy lieutenant commander retired. And uh, from West Virginia, that's why he's crazy. And uh, Harley, he rose a Hardy to church. Hardy soft tail. And uh, anyway, he'd, uh, he, one day he came to me, he said, Brother Doug, he said, we've got uh, one, of our, uh, one of our Bible Institute teachers is leaving this week to go take a church. And we, we need you to fill in on the class to the end of the semester. This was three weeks before the end of the semester. I need you to teach two classes and give a test. Okay. So I did, and, uh, and ended up teaching in the institute. And, and in these different settings, I would tell these different stories. And, and uh, I would talk about what Brother Duff, and I've told the story here many times, where Brother Duff invited us to the house on Saturday afternoons when I was a teenager. And he'd invite the preacher boys over, and he would sit in his living room and teach us. And, and I kept talking about that, and different people would come up to me, and they kept asking me, he says, so when are you going to start that Saturday thing? I said, what Saturday thing? Well, that Bible study, that, like, like your pastor did. I said, I'm not doing that. Now, here's the funny thing, Brother Rich. I was praying daily, God, give me a ministry. Here's one. I don't want that one. Give me a ministry. 
That's what was going on. And finally, it just God would leave me alone about it. I said, okay. So we started the Saturday Bible study. That thing got out of hand. We'd invite people over. Uh, but you just didn't come to the Bible study. I have a four-page application you had to fill out. If I didn't like your answers, you weren't invited. It's getting real quiet, Brother John. So what's on those questions? Oh, you could probably handle the, the, the questions. I mean, I asked questions about, okay, you're, you're, I asked about their salvation and baptism and, and all that. But then I asked them, okay, you know, what ministries you're involved in now? Um, how many people have you witnessed to in the last 30 days? List them. How many people have you won to Christ? Who have you walked down the aisle to get baptized? Where are you reading your Bible today? Just simple questions like that. Man, it, it got a lot quieter than this when I handed out those questionnaires. But we started having people come in, and that thing, it grew to where we were running 30 at the house, 35. And, and then uh, I remember the first Thanksgiving we were there. Uh, we decided that uh, we were looking around. We saw these single guys that uh, didn't have anywhere to go for Thanksgiving. They're in the military. And, like, well, I don't want them going to McDonald's for Thanksgiving. So we, we decided to deep fry some turkey, somebody say amen. And uh, we decided to do that. And, and uh, in fact, Brother Cheney asked me last night about, he said, you going to deep fry some turkey when you come? I said, you set it up, we'll do it. And, uh, but we started doing that, and it got to where it got out of hand on Thanksgiving. We'd have people there, and I got to talk about that in a minute. But one day I was, I was working with one of the young men who had been struggling. He'd been saved and he was in the institute a little bit and then he'd drop out and we get to work with him and all of a sudden he just started getting faithful. One day he was at the altar and I came down to pray with him and, and he, he began to pray and he said, Lord, thank you for Brother Brandenburg for allowing us to come into his home, see him with his family. And he treated us like one of his own. And for the first time, I began to see what a Christian family was about. He talked to me about later. He said, Brother Brandon, you're the first one I've ever seen that would let me in close. And he's still serving the Lord. Still light out, still doing well. What happened? I let him in close. Now, some of the ones I let in close, yeah, they didn't work out so well. So you got a Judas. I don't know if I'd quite call him a Judas, but they might be close. Actually, one of them is. Yeah, one's a Judas. Stabbed me pretty bad. Spiritually speaking. You know what those do, Brother Rich? They make you want to not do that anymore. They want you to, they make you want to put your hand out. It's like, okay, y'all stay back. But you're never going to influence people if you don't let them in close. Why is there a Peter, James, and John? Because he called them. He said he wants them to be with him. In special settings, Jesus would even call them from the other disciples. and said, come with me, guys. Multiple times he'd take them aside. Why? Because he had something for them. But they needed extra training and teaching. If we're going to make a difference this year where we're going to have another family sitting next to us, it's not going to be just because we gave them a track and we text them once a month. That's not cutting it. Just like you will not build a church on spare change and spare time, you won't influence people with spare time either. You're going to have to carve out parts of your life. Uh, from that Saturday Bible study, we ended up, uh, ended up on staff there at Lighthouse, and, and we started a, a, a Monday morning soul winning time. And uh, on Monday mornings, we'd, we'd, I'd meet with some guys, and, uh, and I'm going to give a little bit of detail about that a little bit later, but we, we, we'd meet with them, and I'd disciple a couple, and we'd do some Bible study, and then we'd go soul winning for about five hours. We'd stop in the middle of that to eat. While we were eating, we'd have our Bibles out in the restaurant teaching them. Then we go soul winning some more. Um, you know, those are the people that when I left, they still call me and say, Pastor, we miss you. That's the ones when I listened to the message the other night when uh, Brother Torres was here and he mentioned some people like, they still miss you. You know why? I let them in close. Uh, when I get to San Diego next month, uh, Brother Victor Marshall is going to about choke me to death. He's going to hug my neck. Paul Day is going to do the same thing. Amen. And uh, Paul Day's one of those, he's a police officer, about six foot five, six six, big man. Uh, and he's not a skinny man either, he's a big man. And a uh, police officer. And uh, I invited him for Thanksgiving one night. He said, well, I got to work. I said, you stop and get food while you're working. I've been with you in that police car. So we'll come over to the house. He said, well, if I come, I got to bring my sergeant. I said, bring him too. So here's on Thanksgiving. We've already done our meal, then it's late. It was about six, seven o'clock at night. 
And uh, <laughs> knock at the door, I go out, and there's Paul and, and his partner. And, uh, and then there's his, his sergeant and his partner. And then another police car. I had three police cars out in front of our house. <laughs> Neighbors like, what did the preacher do? You know, <laughs> invited him for food. That's what we did. I felt very safe that night, though. I will promise you that. Amen. Nobody messed with our house for a while after that. Amen. What happens? Jesus let them in close. Let me, let me show you another one. Uh, let's go to the book of 1 Peter, chapter number 1. Or 1 Peter, chapter 2. If we're going to influence people, number one, we must be accessible. That means you're going to have to give them your phone number. Amen. You've got to let them, let them be able to get a hold of you. First Peter chapter number 2, look at verse number 21. For herein too were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps, who did no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. And when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bear our own, uh, bear our own sins in his own body uh, on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but now are returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Notice it said in verse 21 that Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example. If you're going to influence people, if you're going to be a discipler, I mean, you're the one that's doing the teaching. A disciple means a learner, a, a student. If you're going to be the one teaching one of them, first of all, you've got to be accessible. Number two, you must be an example. It says about Jesus, he left us an example that we should follow his steps. You see, the life of Christ is the perfect discipleship course. You want to you learn how to, how to work with people, just follow around what Jesus did. That's what we're doing on Sunday mornings. Jesus showed us how to live. He didn't just tell us. He showed us. Uh, that's why when Jesus was examined by Pilate, and Pilate saw, he said, I find no fault in him. Three times he said that. One time he said, I find no fault in him at all. Well, he could have searched for a millennium, would have never found a fault in him. Amen? You see, when he was accused, the, the accusation didn't stick. Why? People knew his life. He showed us an example. Go to uh, Luke chapter 11, please. I'm just giving you some very simple thoughts. Luke chapter 11. John, quit messing with her. It's John. That's the one we've got to worry about. Luke chapter 11, look at verse number 1. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples. And then he launches into a description, a, a lesson on prayer. Uh, he has what most people call the Lord's Prayer. It's not that. It's, a, it's not even a model prayer. It's an outline of prayer. There's what to pray for. And, and then he gives an illustration, verses 5 and uh, down through verse number 10 uh, on praying. And uh, he, he gives this example. But why did he do that? Because in verse number 1, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. It's interesting. They never said to him, teach us to heal people. Bible doesn't record them, teach us to preach. What was the thing that was so outstanding in his life, they wanted to know how to do it? It's his prayer life. Why? Because they were often with him while he prayed. Notice it says that when he ceased, it means Brother Rich, as he's praying, they're just kind of watching. Like, wow. Last person I saw pray like that was John, meaning John the Baptist. Like, wow. Oh, we better wait. I don't want to disturb him. And when he got done praying, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. He was the example. In, in Acts 11, verse 26, was said the disciples are called Christians first at Antioch. The word Christian means like Christ. The people at Antioch, they had so lived like Jesus. People said, you remind me of him. Well, how did that happen? They just, they were taught that. They followed an example. If you and I are going to make a lasting impact in the people's lives, it's going to be way more than us standing behind a podium somewhere saying something to them. More is caught than taught. The older I get, the more I realize I'm like Brother Duff. Just I, I, I see characteristics once in a while. And I, 
I know where I learned that. He did not teach me that in the classroom. Uh, there's, there's a lot of characteristics I have I know came from Dr. Boyd. Why? I was with him. I rode in a motor home with him. That was always an experience. He's got the duct tape cradle in the middle of his steering wheel with his Bible sitting there. He's reading his Bible while he's driving a bus down the highway. That will increase your prayer life. I promise you. <laughs> I remember once, the first time I was, the first meeting we were driving to, we're driving down the highway and he's in his motor home talking on the CB radio. He loved that CB. His, his handle was good news. They say, what's good news? Wrong person to ask that question. Good news is Jesus loves you. And then he'd just start preaching, you know. And he'd be driving down the road talking on that CB radio and he'd hand you the microphone. Preach, boy. Okay. Your Bible's laying on the bunk in the back. He didn't care. When you're around somebody, you just start doing, okay, that's what you do. You hang around him, you got to do that kind of stuff. With Jesus, it was an example of his prayer life. They watched him and they, they, they wanted to copy that. Uh, go to John chapter 13. And we'll look at uh, verse number one. This last Passover that Jesus spent with his disciples. Verse one, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. The supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper, laid aside his garments and took a towel, girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. So we see Jesus after the meal. He's now washing their feet. Now we've talked about this often. That's not a job anybody applied for. Yeah, that's what I want. I want to wash 30, 30 feet from people. No, you don't want to do that. That's what the lowest servant was told to do. Here's Jesus. He's just explained to them what's about to happen. He's, he's, going, to be, he's going to be crucified. And he says to them, guys, uh, let me wash your feet. He comes to verse number 6. And he cometh to Simon Peter. And Peter said to him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not. But thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Isn't it just like Peter? Oh, no, 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 Lord, you're not going to do that. Just, that's Peter. And Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. And then you see Peter totally changed his mind. So Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. You notice Peter, he, he was like a pendulum. It was never in the middle of the road. It was one extreme or the other. That was Peter. Jesus said unto him, He that is washed need not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. Ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who, would, who should betray him. Therefore he sa uh, said he, ye are not all clean. For after that he had washed their, uh, their feet and taken his garments and was sat down again, he said to them, Know ye what I have done to you? So he asked them, you understand the illustration? You just imagine the blank looks on the faces, a deer in a headlight look. Like, no, we have no idea what you're talking about. He said, ye call me Master and Lord. And you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done unto you. Now, he was not instituting here another ordinance of the church. There's only two, baptism and Lord's Supper. But he was trying to teach them a principle. He said, you need to learn how to be a servant. Disciples, they struggled with that. They're always jockeying on who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom and who was going to have a, have a throne next to his. They even got their mama involved in that. James and John did. Can you imagine that, sending your mama to talk to Jesus to get you a better job? I read that, I was like, that's hilarious. I've often thought of what the, what the other disciples think of that. They probably want to smack him around behind the building, you know. They had a problem with pride. So what's Jesus doing? He brought them in close. It's just them in the room. And what does he do? He shows them by an example. If you and I are going to help people mature in their Christian life, yes, we're going to have to go to them. We're going to have to spend some time with them. But we're going to have to show them an example. You know what that means? If we're going to teach them to be in Sunday night church, we have to be in Sunday night church. Right. If we're going to teach them soul winning, we got to go soul winning. That's right. If we got to teach them to read and study their Bible, we have to read and study our Bible. And they need to see us do it. It's an example. Um, 
Jesus over and over again showed them examples. In 1 Peter, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 4, let's look at that one. This is a good one to mark in your Bible. If you underline verses, this is a great one to mark. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 12. Verse Timothy 4, 12, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. He's writing to this young preacher. He says, I want you to be an example, not to the believers, be the example of a believer. You show them what a believer is. By your life, you demonstrate to them this is how believers act. Notice what he goes on to say. Uh, he says in verse number 13, Till I come give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by the prophecy, but with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. What? All the stuff he just talked to him about. Give thyself wholly to them. Notice this. That thy profiting may appear to all. He said, I want you to be an example. And he lists all these things. And then he gives some application. Uh, let him see you reading. He's talking about the Bible there. Let him see you as you're exhorting, as you're talking to people about the Lord. Uh, let him see your doctrine. Let him see you use the gift God gave you. Right. He said, when you do that, he said, you meditate on these things. Give thyself wholly to them. Notice, God doesn't like halfway Christians. Well, you know, one service is enough. No, he said, give yourself wholly to them. It's interesting, when the 12 spies spied out the land of Israel, in Moses' day, only two men wholly followed the Lord. Joshua and Caleb. The other 10 died. Those two got to go in the land. Why, they wholly followed him. He said, give it all. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. Now look at verse 16. Take heed unto thyself and to the doctor, continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So Timothy, if you will be the example of what a believer is, if you show them how to live, it's going to save your life. It's going to save theirs too. This is where discipleship gets real up close and personal and it starts taking part of our life. Because now they're hanging around with us. And most of us, we're private in a lot of areas. We don't, well, I don't want to see that. But if you're ever going to influence somebody greatly, you've got to open the door and let them get close. You've got to let them, be, let them see an example. Uh, go back to Matthew 28, if you would, please. Matthew 28. I'll give you one more thought. And we have many more on this, but I'm just going to give you this thought. And this one, we, this is the one we expect. Matthew 28. Look at verse number 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. He told them, I want you to be teaching them. I submit to you, you cannot teach something you do not know. I've had some classes where the instructor obviously did not know the material. Anybody ever had one of those classes? Oh, my soul. John's been fighting with one of those with his class. They must be reading a textbook, and they don't even know what those words mean. They're just saying the words. You can't teach somebody something you don't know. It means you've got to learn it first. But Jesus here, he's, he's teaching us. He said, I want you to go and he's teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe. It's interesting how many times in the Gospels you find Jesus teaching. It says in Mark two, uh, four in ver I'm sorry, Mark four and verse two, he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine. It says in Mark ten verse number one, he arose from thence and cometh into the coast of Judea by the farther side of Jordan, and the people resort unto him again, and he was wont, and he taught them again. Luke 4, verse number 31, he came to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. John 8, verse 2, and early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down, and he taught them. Jesus was a teacher. Amen? Uh, go to Acts chapter 1, please. Before we read here in Acts 1, I want you to understand that the book of Acts was penned by 
the, the, by Luke, Dr. Luke, the man who traveled with Paul. He also, of course, penned the, 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 the Gospel of, of Luke. And both books are addressed to the same individual, a man by the name of Theophilus. Look at verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus. That's meaning the book of Luke. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do, that's the example, and teach. That's what you do after you've given the example. The reason the disciples were able to go and reach the world, and they did in their day. How could they do that? They got close to him. They saw his example and they allowed him to teach them. If you and I are going to influence people, we're going to have to teach them. In Luke 11, we looked at it, we won't go back to it, but when, when the disciples saw him praying, said, Lord, teach us to pray. And what did he do? He taught them. Uh, in Acts 5 and verse 42, it says, And daily in the temple and every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. That's what the first church was doing. They'd go everywhere teaching the Word of God. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 2, we've looked at this one already. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying that you, if you're going to be a discipler, you're going to have to get ready to start teaching someone. And we're not talking about having a Sunday school class. I'm talking about one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe it's somebody you work with that you led to Christ or somebody just got saved and, and they ask you, like, man, I don't even know what to do next. There's your opportunity. That's what we're talking about in families reaching families. You're there in Acts. We'll go to, um, this will be our last scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3 and verse number 14. Well, the Bible says, But continue thou in the, the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And what's he referring to? Timothy had been taught by his mother and his grandmother the Scriptures. Paul was, was admonishing him, Continue in what you have been taught. Why was Timothy able to travel with the Apostle Paul as a young man? Why could he be uh, the man that I believe Paul kind of handed his ministry off to in 2 Timothy 4? Because he'd been taught. And it didn't start with Paul. It started with Lois and Eunice. You know what that tells me? Brother Rich, our first discipleship ought to be in our families. We ought to be teaching them. And then, then the people that God brings across our path that we win to Christ, that we have an opportunity to, to work with, uh, you're going to do some teaching. Uh, when we had the, uh, the, the, uh, the Monday morning soul winning there in San Diego, I would take guys and uh, I would meet with them early. And uh, one guy I met every, Carl, I met with him every Monday morning at 8 o'clock. From 8 to 9.30, we would sit either at a Starbucks or at a McDonald's, and we'd study. Uh, the material that I used was this, this study, the ABCs of Christian growth, 26 lessons on, uh, on the Christian life. And I would go through there, and week by week, we'd go through this, and it, it took us a long time. We didn't get it done in 26 weeks. Looking for the outline here. The first one... Um, I had the first couple lessons. What does salvation mean for me? Uh, then um, the second one, what does God expect from me? And then, then the rest of the letter uh, lessons started with an A uh, and then a B and then a C. Lesson one, uh, the assurance of salvation. And so we work through this book. And, have, and all it is is they're looking up Scripture and filling in the blanks and then we talk about it. We've got Scriptures that we would talk about and, and statements. Then the, letter, uh, the next one on the Bible. Uh, letter C, the church. Uh, and that one took a little while. D, our daily walk. Daily walk with God. Talks about our prayer life and Bible reading and all those kind of things. Uh, e, our enemy. And then we would just work our way through. So we'd sit there. Usually he and I would meet at a McDonald's. We'd sit with that big book open up. We'd have our Bible laying there. And we'd sit there for an hour and a half talking about the Bible. Amazing how many people that came to visit our church because they saw us sitting there. Like, what do you, I see you guys studying the Bible. Where do you go to church? By the way, they don't say that if you're reading out of one of these. 
because they don't know what you're reading. If you got one of these laying there, they know what you have. That's why you ought to carry a Bible. Amen. And we would, we would work together through that. We had other books that we would use. and We would study through material. So you did that every week? Yes, every week. Uh, that was just one person. I met with four or five people a week. Different spots. We'd meet at uh, one fellow. He's, um, Brother Rich got to sit in his 1929 Ford. Uh, one of the fellows there that I worked with, he has a, a 29 Ford um, street rod that he built. It's got a, uh, got a 350 Chevy in it. And took me for a ride in that thing. Oh, that was fun. And, uh, but he and I would sit, and we'd sit at a Starbucks. It's pretty funny to go to a, a liberal place like Starbucks with a Bible in your hand and spend an hour studying the Bible. They don't know what to do with you. But as long as you're buying coffee, they'll leave you alone. Amen. What are you saying? Uh, if you're going to get serious about reaching into somebody's life and making a difference, it's going to cost you time bef besides the four hours or so you spend in church a week. So I don't know if I can do that. Well, I don't know about you, but I think a Timothy's worth that. Um, I think a Victor Marshall that I get to see in a couple weeks is worth that. Some people that I was able to influence and spend some time, and they allowed me. Uh, and by the way, they have to be open. That's what we were talking about this morning. They have to be receptive. What do you do? You just keep looking. You know why many times we don't ever do this with anybody? We don't ever ask them. We don't ever show them what's next. That command was given to all of us as believers. In the coming weeks, we're going to look at some more very practical things. Um, I've got a, a great little book here that we're going to, not a little book, but a great book we're going to go through. Uh, a few weeks down the road, uh, probably a couple months from now, we're going to start using this. Uh, this is a book that Brother Chapel wrote that's just incredible. Um, it's the book called Continue, A Biblical Journey in Personal Discipleship. What we're going to do with this one as we get going along and as some of you get real serious about wanting to be a discipler, we're going to have a class where we're going to go through this book together. And then we're going to teach you to take this to go with the, the people that you're trying to disciple. The way this one works, it has a, um, has a different topic for each week that you'll work with the person that you're discipling. You'll sit down and study with it. And then it's got their personal devotions for that week already laid out, matching the lesson you just taught them. So all week long, They'll work on the disciple. They'll work on the devotionals. You'll know where they're reading in their Bible. You'll know what questions they're being asked. So when you meet with them the next week, you can talk about that. And we and we've got these. We already have them in stock, and we'll, we'll get to that. And here's why we do all that. And we've got some other materials that are coming. I was hoping they'd be here before today, but they'll they'll be here by next Sunday. A little book we've used called First Steps for New Believers. It's a very simplified version of this one. Uh, you see, why are we doing all this? Because I want us to be real serious about helping people who get saved to go on for God. How many people have I seen get saved that nobody took the time to try to disciple them and we don't see them anymore? You're thinking of some right now. Oh yeah, they were here. What happened? They didn't get plugged in. You know why we're here? Somebody got to us and spent some time with us. Somebody invested in us, and we responded. The challenge this year is let's do more than hand out tracts. Let's invest in the lives of people. Everybody in this room can do that. All of us can. But it's going to take an investment. But it's the kind of investment that pays off for generations. I love hearing the story of, of Dr. Larry Brown from North Augusta, South Carolina. He talks about when he got saved and when he first got saved, the, the, the little preacher that led him to Christ would spend a little time with him and started discipling him. And then that preacher got run off from the whole church. But there was an older lady that loved God and took Brother Brown and his wife and brought them over to the house every week. She'd cook dinner for him. She said, we never got to eat dinner warm. It was always cold by the time we got to it. He said, because she'd want to pray with us. And said, by the time she got done praying, the food was cold. Said, but we'd eat, and then she'd teach us the Bible. It's Brother Brown and his wife, just a little old lady in the church that loved God. And he said for the first, I think it was two or three years, she discipled them every week. 
That's a pretty good investment. You got a pastor who's been in the ministry now since 1975. I think that's a pretty good investment. God wants to use us. He's so chosen this plan that He doesn't write the message in the sky. He gives it to us to carry out the, the message of the gospel. But it doesn't end there. But if we're going to be a disciple, we're going to have to be like Jesus. We're going to have to be with them. We have to spend some time with people. You have to invest in them. Uh, you have to let them see the example. But then we're going to have to get verbal. We're going to have to teach them. And we're going to give you the tools to do that. So on Sunday nights for several weeks more, we're going to be teaching along those lines. Then, then we'll, we'll have the other class to get real serious about it. We want you to be a part of it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the example of our Savior. Thank you for those that invested in our lives. Would you help us to be concerned about those around us and realize that just one hour on a Sunday is not going to cut it. They'll not have a life that pleases you just because they casually showed up for one service once a month. Would you burden our hearts to want to see people grow and to go on for you? But then would you do more than burden us and, and, and convict us? Would you change us? Would you help us to commit to investing in the lives of people so that we can watch them grow and then they in turn can reach others? Father, I pray you'd help us as a church to be serious in this matter. May you use us. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm actually to stand with heads bowed and eyes closed. The invitation is very simple tonight. If tonight God is talking to you about this matter of discipleship, about teaching and helping somebody, would you come and kneel at an altar and say, God, I want to be a part of that? Would you ask Him to put somebody on your mind that you could help? Well, I'm not saying you jump into the whole program right now, but you just start spending some time with them and encouraging them. As Brother John sings, you come. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and get your song, but go to page number 841. That's the song John was just singing. He's going to come lead that for us. It's written by Dr. John R. Rice. It's one of my favorite songs that he wrote. We're going to sing this, and we'll start with verse number one, Brother John, and we'll sing that one together. What a great song. Convicting one. We'll sing it. Uh, let's start with verse number one. first so little time the harvest will be over our reaping done we reapers taken home report our work to Jesus Lord of harvest 
and hope he'll smile and that he'll say well done today we reap or miss our golden harvest today is given us lost souls to win oh then to save some near ones from the burning today we'll go to bring some sinner in on the second how many times i should have strongly pleaded how often did i fail to strictly warn the spirit moved oh had i pled for jesus the grain is fall on the third Despite the heat, the ceaseless toil, the hardship, the broken heart, or those we cannot win, misunderstood, because we're all peculiar, still no regrets we'll have but for our sin. Today we reap or miss our golden harvest. Today is given us lost souls to win. Oh, then to save some near ones from the burning. Today we'll go to bring some sinner in on the fourth. A day of pleasure or a feast of friendship, a house or car or garments fair or fame, will all be trash when souls are brought to heaven. And then how sad to face the slacker's blame on the last. The harvest white with reapers few is waiting and many souls will die and never know the love of Christ, the joy of sins forgiven. Oh, let us weep and love and pray and go. Today we reap or miss our golden harvest. Today is given us lost souls to win. Oh, then to save some near ones from the burning. Today we'll go to bring some sinner in.